You know, I, in 1975, I graduated from high school and got into, uh, got hired by a local wastewater utility company. Then I got my degree after a few years. I got hired by the National Park Service. And here I am talking about crap again. So it's, I just can't get away from it. And, and this has been an international uh, conference. I did learn a new word today. It's uh, diaben or unco, right? Yes, okay. They, they know what I'm talking about up here. <laughs> but anyway, I've been uh, with the uh, National Park Service for about uh, be 22 years um, in a few, few days. And uh, I was asked to come up here and talk about uh, the backcountry uh, waste disposal systems. And we're a, we're a national program, so I'll, I'll give you a, a little bit about the Park Service. Uh, you that haven't been in the Park Service or don't know anything about the Park Service, the purpose is to conserve the scenery and the natural and historic objects and the wildlife therein and to provide for the enjoyment of the same in such manner and by such means as will leave them unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations. So this is our mantra, how we, uh, how we run things. Uh, First National Park was Yellowstone. We have over 390 park units. I'm sure Gary's gonna be talking about a lot of this stuff. Covers uh, 84 million acres and about the size of Montana, I think, is all, if you put all the parks together. And a lot of the big parks are in Alaska. And let's talk about a little bit about the Public Health Service and the National Park Service. Um, in 1918, there was a handwritten note where an officer went out and uh, was checking the water systems in uh, Yellowstone. So that's the first uh, time a public health service officer, that was before the EPA, the CDC, all those uh, government acronyms came into being. U.S. Public Health Service was, has been around since 1798, I believe. Uh, in 1955, it's, uh, we had a uh, MOA, it was an agreement between government to government agreement between the National Park Service and the U.S. Public Health Service that we would work with the Park Service and do inspections and surveys on sites. And just recently, thank you, in uh, 2009 through efforts of uh, Chuck Higgins and some of the other staff in Washington, we were able to do a, a more uh, broader scope and we have an MOA with the Department of Interior now. So what do we do? Uh, we're an interagency sp specifically with public health capabilities managed, funded, and operated by the National Park Service. A lot of people see me and they say, uh, what's the Navy doing in town? And I'd say, well, this is the uniform that we're supposed to be wearing now. We, uh, we used to have several other uniforms, but we're a little bit limited because we're uh, we're, we kind of follow the Navy ranking system, and uh, so now we're detailed. You have a U.S. Public Health Service officer coming out and uh, looking at systems. And basically, we have uh, disease surveillance systems, response, on-site evaluation, hazard analysis, consulting, policy guidance, and coordination. Uh, we do a lot of things. Uh, there's about 14 of us that are public health consultants that cover the nation. And then the, the other uh, public health officers are typically detailed to the national parks and work directly for them as uh, consultants, as engineers, uh, industrial hygienists, safety officers, things like that. So we're, we're uh, run by director's order and uh, director's order 83 is kind of our marching order. And we're somewhere in the middle of that snake, I think, I'm not sure. So. Basically, we, we look at uh, food, water, wastewater, sanitation, and uh, there's director's orders written, and we follow those based on our committee, what we come up with and, and ask for us to do out while we're out in the parks. So reference manual A1 says, well, we will reduce, or park managers, not us, park managers will reduce the risk of disease transmission to park visitors 
partners and staff, and that's important to notice that uh, we're not just about the, the uh, visitation or the visitors to the park, it's about also the staff that's out there working within the, uh, within the system. So we have operations, minimum standards for public health are maintained in the back country where typically front country standards cannot be achieved. And so in reference manual 83F, it talks about human waste will be safely disposed of in an approved manner and in compliance with the requirements of the local National Park Service unit. So basically we give the Park Service control over how they will uh, deal with this, this uh, UNCO. We, we rely on the park managers to make decisions. We're there to uh, evaluate, help them make the right decision. We're not there to tell them what to do. We're there as a consultant and to move them forward. So right now, I did a uh, survey uh, in 2003. I was curious to see where all the UNCO went. And so I found out that uh, 102 park units were involved in backcountry activities and uh, annual vis backcountry overnight visitation is around 1.8 million. So that's out of uh, 266, 000, or 266 million recreational visits. And uh, looking at our statistics page, uh, we, I found that there's still approximately 102 parks with backcountry activities, and we're up to about 1.8 million uh, annual backcountry visits, and about 0.65% of all those stays are in the backcountry. And over, we've, they've been taking statistics over a 31 year period, and we have a lot of, uh, looks like a lot of UNCO out there in the, in the backcountry. So there's, there's the stats, averages, so there's actually been an increase in uh, backcountry usage, about 3.4 percent. So, uh, and then the visitation is about 3.8 percent. So this just shows you different uh, regions: Alaska, Midwest, Capital, Northwest, Northeast, Pacific West. I'm in the Pacific West area, uh, Southeast region. So it shows percentages of uh, recreational visits per region. And Alaska has the most land mass, but we only get 1% uh, of visitation. Everybody's up there between uh, June and, and August or middle of September. So that's it, the same thing, just broken down in a colorful slide, because I, I thought I needed to add some color to the, the slide. So this is uh, overnight stays. When I looked at the, the backcountry information, it was interesting that uh, a few of the parks that I haven't read stand out because about 68% uh, of the visitation is uh, backcountry. That's Delaware Water Gap, Isle Royal, and Canyonlands. Of course, when you look at the numbers, uh, Grand Canyon leads the pack by far. Okay, let's see how, what do we do with, uh, with the disposal of UNCA? We got, uh, you know, this is a, a valuable resource in the National Park Service bathrooms. It's so valuable that we padlock these so people don't <laughs> steal them. <laughs> so we consider this a resource. That's right. The alternative isn't pleasant. So what did, we, what did I say earlier that it's supposed to be disposed of in an approved manner in compliance with the local National Park Service unit? So we got a couple examples I wanted to go through real quick. Uh, North Cascades, it's uh, in the Pacific Northwest in between Spokane and uh, Seattle. And uh, they have uh, composting Romtech toilets and uh, Kerry Cook actually in 2006 walked to all these sites, evaluated them, did a, a study, and did a paper for the park. I don't know many people are very, uh, aware of the availability of this, but I, I do have a way to get it to you with a PDF file if you're interested. And then the Grand Canyon uh, Raptors, you got over 35,000 people on annual visits. So these are kind of the, the two spectrums. What do they do? 
so there's the Romtech toilet. It's uh, it's helicoptered up to uh, these these peaks in the North Cascades. Uh, you have a lot of privacy here. Uh, you kind of just sit out there in the open and you can enjoy that southern view. And uh, it's got a little so, uh, solar pad on the back of it. And I don't believe they make these anymore. Um, but uh, these, these seats strap down or tie down and uh, these things open up here and you can scoop up the uh, unca out of the, out of the bottom of the, the uh, toilet. And uh, you can see a lot of damage on these because of the snow load and the hinges will uh, be replaced a lot. Like Joe was saying, uh, maintenance is a big issue with uh, backcountry operations. So keep it simple if it's in the backcountry. Uh, prior to 1981, they were just uh, using these 35 gallon bolts and they, they upgraded to the uh, Romtech toilets. Uh, as a 2006 study with a carry study, uh, 50, half of them were at capacity and the longer unit was in service, the greater the compost pile, which, you know, that's, you know, and the rangers have to go up there, hike up there and stir the pile and add peat moss. So this is maintenance that has to be done and it's, uh, it's done by the uh, park uh, backcountry rangers. And then as the number of users increased, so did the moisture content. So I kind of put all the information in a overview and you can see these are all the different sites. I didn't list them by name, just by number. And they kind of correspond. You can see it direct uh, peaks and valleys in, uh, in number of, of uh, visitors compared to the moisture content. And that's a uh, percent of optimum moisture in the pile. And I'm not sure how Carrie got all this information. She's uh, she, I don't know what kind of equipment she took up there, and she, she took samples back with her too. So here's the, the Grand River, uh, Grand Canyon River. And you can see it's a, a very large operation, a lot of people. Um, it's, it's a valley, not a lot of soil, uh, cliffs straight up and down. You're maybe a mile down sometimes in the canyon, very hot down there. Uh, and they're, they're running a lot of people down the river. Uh, and basically what they do is they, they have these uh, haul out systems where they'll dump the, the rocket boxes or the, uh, the canisters into uh, septic systems and those will be hauled to, uh, to wastewater treatment plants. And they also have a system where they run a scat machine too. And we saw a picture of that earlier. And there's the uh, little bit of privacy on this one. There's the ammo box and the, uh, the toilet lid. And again, uh, if you look at the figures, uh, 35,000 people, and this is on an annual basis, use the water. And there's a big operation. There's coolers, believe it or not, that they have ice in these and they transport food down there. And some of these trips are for seven to 10 days. And we have officers that uh, go with uh, some of these rafters and monitor them and make sure that the food is at the right temperature. And I said, there's no way that that food's going to stay cold in these coolers, but they assure me it does. I've been, been begging to go on one of these trips, but uh, that's, that's kind of my end saying, I don't believe you. You know, you should take me down there and show me. We've, uh, we've also, in our, our backcountry uh, paper, we, on uh, 83F, is uh, flush toilets. These are suitable backcountry waste disposal. We're not going to exclude flush toilets. If you can get them in there and get up, get the solids out, uh, that's great. Uh, composting toilets, barrel toilets, evaporative toilets, incinerator toilets, pit privies. And I, I just threw this one in. This hasn't been added yet onto our official, uh, our official publication. But I did it for Bill because I know he's, he's a real big proponent of moldering toilets up in Alaska. So we'll get that added, Bill, as soon as, as, soon as I get back. And so how much do we produce about uh, the studies I've looked at, about, uh, about 0.5 pounds of onca a day. Uh, 
It can range anywhere from 0.44 to 0.77. Uh, bacteria responsible for about half to a third of the, uh, the fecal weight. And um, a study showed that there was a direct cor correlation between gender, body weight, age, and uh, bread cons consumption. It was done in Iraq, so I'm not sure what... I didn't, I didn't do a literature search and, and uh, check, check on that, but that's what, it, that's what the uh, statement was. So again, those are the numbers. And if we extrapolate those out to weights, we're talking about, on an annual basis, about 7.7 .7 tons of onca coming out of uh, Grand Canyon. Or for the whole park service, 872,000 pounds. So that has to go somewhere, and it has to go somewhere safely. So. That's me when I was a lot taller and had a lot less hair. <laughs> so let's talk about pathogens and survival. Bacteria and pathogen organisms or survival are affected by, we already talked about a lot of this, moisture content, type of organism, nutrients, temperature, sunlight. So survival moisture, they like uh, 10 to 20% moisture. Bacteria don't like being outside of the body. It's, they kind of like it there and inside. So once you get them out and you dry them out, they, they kind of die. Uh, some of organisms like worms can exist for years in the soil. Uh, some cysts, like we talked about Giardia and Crypto, they can last for a long time. Uh, pathogens and, and survival. Coliforms, 38 days in soil. Salmonella, up to 120 days. Shigella, two to 10 days or 42 days in wastewater. And most enteroviruses pass through sewage stream of plants and survive in surface water. Uh, I know we, uh, Chuck and Adam and, and a few others have, have talked about the studies they've done on the Grand Canyon, and they did find uh, norovirus in the, in the water. And at the time, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the people that were running the the river rafting uh, trips were actually grabbing the water out of the uh, river and not treating it and drinking it. These are the, the river dogs, the old guys with the beards that have been running the rivers for years. And they've, they've kind of gotten away from that since they have to uh, go through an inspection through us. So we don't want any passengers or any people thinking you can just go to a, a river body and you're downstream of a wastewater treatment plant and take a sip of the, of the Colorado. Uh, nutrients increase survival rate. Uh, low temperatures favor survival. Uh, 25C uh, was bacteria survival was shortest and in most cases longest at 4 degrees C. Uh, sunlight, exposure to sunlight increases the death rate. Uh, enterococci, those are typically used to um, measure the uh, stream quality when you do beach surveys. Uh, those are most affected by sunlight. Uh, fecal coliforms are less somatic colophages and uh, enteric viruses. So again, those enteric viruses are, are difficult to kill. So human exposure, routes of entry, uh, inhalation, ingestion, absorption, and injection. And so which one do you... You can probably guess which one we're kind of concerned about with uh, public health. You don't normally snort the stuff. You don't uh, you don't roll around in it typically, and you don't uh, jam it into your into your body. So usually we're worried about ingestion. So uh, the best way, you know, we talk about separation and keeping flies away. Uh, you got. People playing in the dirt, we don't want any contaminated soil or waste around there because what happens is people in the back country, there's no hand washing facilities typically, and uh, people will use, it's called the fecal oral route. Uh, they'll forget to wash their hands when they're doing something, they'll eat a food, and the, and the uh, feces or unca is on the, on the food. They consume it, and they get sick. So how do we protect people from this? 
Uh, visitors is really difficult uh, unless they're with the concessions operation. If they're on their own, uh, they got to kind of read the signs and obey the directions. And any of you that have worked with the public, and I'm sure a lot of you have, it's uh, education is a, a tough thing when you're talking about, uh, you know, two to 300 people using a trail a day up to uh, several thousand. So uh, if you can provide safe methods for collection and disposal, uh, engineering the controls in there, uh, these toilet systems that are designed specifically for different places work really well. If you don't want to have some something that was designed uh, inappropriately, that way you get more exposure. Um, and then a thing we've been doing lately, uh, more so in the uh, Intermountain region, is uh, George Lucas, Adam Kramer, and uh, Joe Winkelmeyer, they've been we had a cooperative agreement with CDC, and they were they were pioneering some uh, disease surveillance uh, tactics. Uh, mostly, it was just people that showed GI illnesses, and they were tracking those people through uh, oh, instances of they're having a run on uh, anti-diarrheal medication at the pharmacy. Uh, they were trying everything they could to try and figure out if there was an ep uh, episode of people getting ill. And most of the illnesses have been uh, related to norovirus. Uh, so the MPS backcountry staff, uh, you know, we, we regulate, uh, recommend certain protective equipment that you wear when you're cleaning out the, the uh, stuff out of the bottom of these things. Uh, we recommend vaccinations. Uh, most of the employees get, have health care and we have injury prevention guidelines and safety requirements uh, as related to hand washing, lifting, those kind of things. Uh, as far as vaccinations, right now the CDC recommends for uh, operators, wastewater workers, that uh, tetanus is recommended for maintenance workers and other employees. Uh, we get a lot of questions about hep A, is it recommended? And we typically say no. If you're wearing the protective equipment, you don't have that exposure. So, so I got one of my kids to pose for a picture. Now he's 15, I'm sure he doesn't, doesn't want to see that. No, that's actually not my kid. I wouldn't do that. Maybe I would now that he's 15, but not then. <laughs> Final treatment and disposal methods. In 2003, I had a survey done. I, did a survey based on uh, phone calls and issues and uh, basically in 2003 49% uh, was the waste was disposed of in wastewater treatment plants, 6% by incineration, 9% was other methods and uh, pit toilets and cat holes were still a large percentage. And this shows, uh, it kind of divides it up a little bit, uh, the treatment plants uh, 3% septic tanks were more prevalent at 20%. There's a lot of EVAP, DVAP vault toilets. Uh, cat holes was 11%. Carry out was 15. Pit privy was 15. And compost was 14%. Again, the collection method is site specific and dependent on local conditions and resources. So we're a, a, a proponent and a consultant to help you reach that. Transpor co transportation costs are an important aspect. Uh, helicopters are very expensive. Uh, llamas aren't. I guess uh, systems must be dependable. If it's broken out in the back country, uh, where are they going to, they're going to use the surrounding area. They're not going to use, if they can't use the toilet, they're going to go somewhere and it's going to be on the ground. Uh, Basically, the backcountry must re remove or treat about 52, 522 tons of uh, unca annually. Uh, and I think from my experience, I've been doing this with the Park Service for about 10 years. Uh, the keys to success are dependability. You can, you, if you can build it, it's going to stay uh, functioning. Uh, make it simple. Funding is an important aspect because you need need to have the personnel and the education and the inspection 
and somebody has to pay for the routine operation and maintenance of these things. And one thing I found out that uh, methods that do reduce waste, weight, do, that reduces the cost of the item because it's, it's cheaper and lighter to get out of the backcountry. And then viruses are typically the most difficult to eliminate or treat. Is there a written policy for compost disposal? Does it have to be carried to the front country? Can it be buried in the back country? Basically, it has to follow uh, 503 regulations for EPA. It, right now, Kerry was working on a plan to get the park to accept the biosolids, basically. And uh, she had a plan in place where they could take about three or 400 uh, pounds of the solids and put it on pasture land. Then they, but they'd have to cover it with soil and leave it for 30 days. And so there's a lot of maintenance and activities. You can either put it on uh, and remediate it, or you can take it down to the local land uh, wastewater treatment plant and dump it. So it's more cost effective, basically, to take it down to the wastewater plant right now. Um, I have a similar question on the same vein. Is there um, are there fees involved with the, the 503 um, regulations? and? Well, the question I ask, Mount Shasta has a um, functional composting toilet, and they carry all the waste down and put it in the landfill because their pers um, perspective, I guess, or their perception is that it's very expensive to go through with those regulations. Yes and no. Uh, what happens is uh, the park has other policies where they don't want invasive species inside the national parks, so it's very difficult with our regulations to uh, land apply inside the national parks. But uh, regulations are less stringent outside the national parks. So uh, if you can have a biosolids and apply it to you know, land and have the 503 regulations met, you know, that's, that's probably easier than, uh, you know, they, she had very uh, high resistance from the national park to add that add that to the land and uh, so with all the added maintenance and stuff and adding the soil and leaving the, the pasture land closed for 30 days it just wasn't feasible but if she could do it off-site I think you know that's a possibility because I hate to see it just get dumped into uh, when you're doing all this work to make a uh, biosolids that could be uh, a nutrient for the soil you're waste kind of wasting a resource but uh, there's costs involved. Um, and costs in the fees, like just alone, or is it mostly in, in the management doing it properly? It's managing the resource, uh, burying it with four inches of soil, uh, you know, finding a place that the park will accept it, uh, some, some hurdles to overcome, but, you know, some parks may be able to do that. That's just one example. This is kind of a follow-up to that, and I'm not an expert on it, but it's so ironic that you have a photograph of one of the Denali National Park sled dog kennels yes. up there. I recognize that dog. That's, uh, I believe that that's Sepla, and he retired about, I don't know, 15 years ago. <laughs> but the reason why I mention it is that uh, in terms of turning poop into a resource, the USDA Soil Conservation Service and the Dolly National Park kennels manager at the time, Gary Coy, did quite a bit of work to look at um, dog waste composting. And I don't know if folks have keyed into that, but that should be followed up on because that's a good resource for looking at work that's already been done to study pathogens. And, and there might be some interagency blending that can move that process forward. I don't think that. Um, they had any problems at all. Okay. And requirements to bury the, the final product wouldn't be necessary for the results that they found with composting dog waste. And, and dog pathogens are different from human pathogens. I know hookworm is one of the things they worry about with uh, dogs and that kind of stuff, but uh, I'm not aware of the study. I'm actually going up to Alaska next week so I can, I can kind of probe around and see what's, what's up with that. Okay, I can talk with you more afterwards, but after the, that Soil Conservation Service study, 
the Uni University of Alaska Fairbanks Cooperative Extension Service picked up on it for human waste composting okay. uh, with our uh, municipal waste facilities in Fairbanks. So I think there's some human waste composting work that's been done as well. John, I had a question about um, disease transmission. So, you know, cat hole method and pack out methods, it's you're dealing with your own germs, right. probably. Yes. It's when you share germs with other people. And I, my question is with these uh, toilet systems, is there any, any way to, to uh, do some follow up monitoring on that, on disease transmission? I mean, I know we're going up shoveling the stuff out and transporting it out, but is there any, any way to monitor to see if people are getting sick after that? Oh, of course. Yeah, that's just something that we need to key in on in case uh, there are people getting ill. I mean, typically, I don't get reports from the park about ill workers. There is a d disease reporting uh, form that we're, we have available. So if the parks are interested in that, and it's something that we can capitalize on to determine if there are illnesses out there with the park employees. But I think it's something that we could do some follow-up testing with the, uh, with the uh, residue from those toilets that are getting hauled down there and just see if, you know, what kind of pathogens are typically in those at, at certain parks. It just takes time and money to do that and some awareness, but certainly we could, we could be involved in that process. 